Our call to worship this morning, Luke 2.52, a short but one of the most profound verses in all of Scripture. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And in a little bit, we're going to be looking at one little glimpse that we get at the childhood of Jesus, our only glimpse really at his childhood, and uh, looking forward to that. Let's sing together. Would you stand with me? Number 25 in the book, if you like. Number 25, oh, magnify the Lord. Verses 40 through 51. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became twelve, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it but supposed him to be in the caravan, and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. We thank the Lord for his word this morning. Number 144, as we continue in song, 144, day by day. Oh, 
Heir to take as from a father's hand. Heir to take as from a father's hand. When the whole church gets sick at about the same time, God knows all about it, and God allowed it, and God's got a reason for it. When the weather's bad enough we can't have church the first Sunday of the month, the first Sunday of the year, God knows all about it. You ever think about it when you get upset about the weather? This from a former baseball coach slash roofer. You ever think about it when you get upset about the weather? Who are you really upset with? The meteorologist has nothing to do with it. It's really all from God's hand, isn't it? And we realize that what we take, we take is from a father's hand. And uh, he loves us, and he's got a purpose, and we trust him for it. And he knows where we're at, and he's there with us. And we trust him for that, too, and we're grateful. All righty. Children are dismissed to junior church. Fellas, I'm going to let you off the hook for um, men's impromptu. Good question. What did I do? Hmm. Okay. I don't know about you, but I like a good biography. Um, I like biographies of famous people. I like early childhood biographies. Uh, I, as a child in California, went to a school that was called American Heritage Christian School, and we had a steady diet of er American, especially early American history. And uh, where our founding fathers were believers, it was pointed out to us and celebrated. And uh, we got a steady diet of these things. And um, I remember uh, reading a simple biography of Thomas Jefferson when I was a kid, and it still sticks with me all these years later that he was a great kicker of stones. When he, when he would walk on the path, he would kick a stone out ahead of him and then keep kicking a stone out ahead of him. And uh, one day he was tracked down by somebody, and uh, he, he didn't think he could be tracked. And the man says, well, it wouldn't have been so easy except you're a great kicker of stones. Uh, so... I can identify just that little bit with one of our uh, brighter presidents and that he was a kicker of stones. When I was a wee lad, I liked that too. Um, as a kid in Indiana, we used to take people, when they came to visit, we'd take them to New Harmony, Indiana. New Harmony is over on the Illinois-Indiana line down in the southernmost part of both states. And um, it is one of the boyhood homes of Abe Lincoln. My hometown of Boonville, Indiana, still has on, proudly on its water tower, Boonville, Indiana, where Lincoln learned the law. Abe Lincoln learned the law in Boonville. I don't know who taught him, but he learned it there. It's on the water tower. It has to be true. Uh, but uh, we take pride in him. But when people would come to visit us, we would take them to New Harmony to the Lincoln Boyhood Home Memorial. And um, there were a couple of things that, that stood, up there, stood out there. Uh, but it was kind of the only place around, that and the Newburg locks where the big coal barges would come through the shallow part of the river with a system of locks. Other than that, there wasn't a lot to be seen. But I remember going and they had a, they had a, a replica of the little cabin that Lincoln grew up in, and it was incredibly small and simple. Uh, to, to go from there to the White House, what a thing. Uh, just a tiny, tiny, tiny little cabin with a sleeping loft and he and all of the sisters and brothers he had at the time lived there. One time, Mom was away. Um, Abe Lincoln, by the way, had Marfan's disease, and Marfan's affects the connective tissue. It's why if you see pictures, he had very long and gangly-looking limbs and hands and feet and uh, a concave chest. That's from Marfan's, but he had very large feet. He got his brother to help him, and uh, he went outside, and he walked around in the mud, and then his brother held him upside down and he walked across the ceiling. And when mom came home, there were muddy footprints, clearly and obviously Abe's, all the way across the ceiling. Uh, so anyway, we like biographies. We like to hear something that makes someone maybe a little more human to us. We love to hear things that 
about their boyhood that help us understand how this person rose to an occasion and became a famous, you know, general or uh, admiral or otherwise. And we like stories like that. It's really rather profound to me that we do not have a childhood biography of Jesus. We, we have most of what we've seen thus far has been the preliminaries and no matter which gospel you look at, you know, John jumps right in that Jesus existed before time itself. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Mark jumps right into the ministry of Christ. Matthew gets into the um, prophecies of Christ, and Luke does a little bit as well. And Luke, as we've seen, goes, is going back and forth between John the Baptist and Jesus, John the Baptist and Jesus, uh, throughout these first few chapters here of his gospel. Uh, but there is very, very, very little about Jesus as he was growing up. We left off a couple weeks ago uh, with Jesus being eight days old. Eight days old, he's gone to the temple to be circumcised. He's gone to the temple to be named uh, Simeon, who's been allowed to live long enough to see the baby Messiah come, uh, proclaims this and, and says he's ready to die and and go to the Lord's paradise because he has seen the Lord's salvation. He has seen Messiah himself. And so that was last we saw was eight days old. And now we're gonna skip all the way to age 12. And the next time we talk about Jesus, he's gonna be 30. And this is how much we get of his childhood. This passage, small as it is, is one little glimpse. Uh, this is not an early childhood biography, really not much of an early childhood biography at all. This really serves to, only to mark the day, uh, day, perhaps the day that Jesus made clear that he knew who he truly was and what his relationship was to God the Father. This is the first time Jesus speaks, and the first that were recorded for us, obviously he talked before this, but the first time his words are recorded for us in scripture, and his words say that he had to be in his father's house. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll dig in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us instruction. Thank you that you have given us, Lord, uh, the story of your son, and thank you above all that you sent him to die in our place and for our sin. And uh, Lord, as we study this morning, may we never lose sight of the price that was paid for us. And Lord, may we truly live for the Christ who died in our place, and we pray it in his name. Amen. Um, Passover. Verse 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Uh, what is Passover? I remember a couple times I've had to go to the Jewish rehab home in Worcester and a uh, very nicely run place. We had a couple in our church that had his and hers knee surgeries. They each had a knee replaced on the same day and they recovered together in the same room at the Jewish home. It was kind of nice. Went to see them and I rode the elevator down, and there were a couple of ladies that got on a floor below me, and there were signs on the elevator, and one of them was celebrating the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim, that's the story of Esther, right? And uh, Mordecai and Haman, not spelled the same way, but Haman's the bad guy in that story. But these ladies said to each other in front of me, I don't even know what Purim's about. I felt led, and I says, well, I could tell you about Purim. You want to talk about Purim? And so I rode the elevator further than I had to so that I could keep chatting with these ladies about Purim uh, and, and what they were celebrating and the deliverance that happened there on, because of Queen Esther uh, going to the king and so forth. Uh, but we, we know so often what these festivals are about, what these holidays, which are holy days, are about, Passover, is the highest holiday, if you will, on the Jewish calendar. Passover goes back to the 10th plague of the Egyptian plagues that God sent back when, at the beginning of the Exodus at the end of their imprisonment. Passover was when the death angel came and took the oldest living male of the household, except for those households that obeyed the Lord, that sacrificed the lamb and that painted the blood on the doorpost. And the death angel said, as was, did as was promised, seeing the door on the lentils passed over, hence the name Passover, and left those houses alone. And of course, at the end of that night, 
the Egyptians couldn't get the Israelites out of town fast enough. And they were saying, hey, listen, here's my grandmother's earrings. Here's grandma, here's Aunt Sally's brooch. And, you know, you, you take everything the family has. And so God said, I'll give you a treasury. That was the Egyptians basically paying them to see them on their way. Go, get gone, go. And so God did an amazing thing that night. And it's commemorated every year with Passover. Passover was commanded. The adult males of Israel had to go back to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And they would kill lambs. And the lamb to be a Passover lamb had to be spotless without blemish. Not a scar, not a bruise, not a break. Um, <clears throat> the first two days of the Passover, Passover took in total about eight days, depending on how you reckon it, seven or eight days. Really, it was eight days or parts of. And uh, the beginning of it was mandatory. The first two days were a must. And after that, it was up to people whether they stayed around or not. And largely that had to do with commitment levels, but it also had to do with how far away you lived and the age of your family and what your circumstances were. Uh, but two days were mandatory, and um, you could stay longer if you wanted. The males had to. It was required of them to go to Passover. The women were allowed, but they were not mandated to attend. They could go, but they didn't have to go. You see here, verse 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So it was Joseph and Mary's practice to go together to Passover. That was the norm for them, was to go every year. Uh, you, if you've lived in and around Jewish people, maybe you know a little bit about Bar Mitzvah. Uh, bar Mitzvah is where a 13-year-old young man becomes responsible to live according to the law. He becomes himself a son of the covenant. And uh, that happened for a 13-year-old young man. As an 11 and 12-year-old young man would be welcome to come and encouraged to come and attend to kind of see what it's all about and get some exposure to it. So here we have Jesus at age 12, roughly a year ahead of his time to become a son of the covenant and responsible to keep the Old Testament law as a spiritual adult male, uh, so forth. Uh, there, it's interesting that they were, you know, that is their age, if you will, where they're personally responsible is at age 13. I find that pretty profound. Um, I taught junior high for a long time. I've spent a lot of time with people in that age group, and I've watched them. And uh, parents, be aware, your children, and it, it, a lot of these things are going to happen earlier than they ever have before because the world is going to challenge thinking earlier than they ever have before. But certainly in those, er, those late preteen and early teen years, children are sorting a thing out for themselves. This is what my mom believes. This is what my dad believes. What do I believe? Is this mine? They're going to ask questions. We're going to talk about question asking in the general in a moment. Uh, you know, be patient when those kids are incessant with their questions. The more questions they have, the more intelligent they are. So take heart. Uh, the reason they're wearing, part of the reason they're wearing you out is they're wicked smart and uh, they want to learn things and they think you know. At this age, they think you know all of it and so they're asking you. And that day is going to disappear and you're not going to know nothing in a couple years. Uh, forgive my terrible grammar, but you get what I'm saying. Um, but that age, sorting it out for oneself, asking questions. I got to tell you, I loved teaching junior high Bible in a Christian school. I love that opportunity to be able to have the Word of God open in front of kids that were sorting things out for themselves. Some of those kids have made me so proud. They're raising families in the Lord. They're serving the Lord in all sorts of different places. And some of them are in the military. Some of them are law enforcement. Some of them are in ministry. Uh, some of them are just doing a fantastic job raising their kids, and I'm so proud of them. And others of them have broken my heart. That's the nature of it. They're sorting these things out for themselves. And so here is Jesus. He's, becoming, he's coming of age. That age 13 is where they're officially responsible before the Lord. But you know, most of the things that an adult male would have responsibility with, uh, holding an office and so forth, he had to be 30 before he could do that. And so there's quite a gap there between 13 and 30 uh, where we all have to do a lot of growing up, especially us fellas. We just do our growing up slower 
seems to be the nature of it. Uh, but it was normal for a young boy to go a year or so before and get the lay of the land and be exposed to it. This is not necessarily the first time Jesus is gone, but it's possibly the first time Jesus is gone. We just don't know. Um, <clears throat> and as they were returning, verse 43, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. Okay, show of hands, who here has left a child behind at church? Come on, yep. Uh, there's been a few. A couple surprises here, but a couple that weren't. Um, in defense of a couple of the moms who raised their hand, they brought a lot of kids to church. So that's a lot to keep track of. Who's been left behind at church? Am I it? My parents left me and we lived in the city. I was scared right to death. Um, <clears throat> I was afraid I was going to leave kids behind. It got kind of hard and it, it relates in the modern world. It's still re I can relate to their day. Uh, you know, we, we come from where and we're always the last people out of the church. And our kids didn't want to be the last people out of the church. And so they would get rides with Ann. And when Alicia got her license, they'd be riding with Alicia. And then Riley got his license, and then Nick, and then so, you know. And there were times where we're, we come out, and our kids weren't here. And we didn't know if they were home or not, and we were kind of left hoping so. But those things can happen. And then think about, this is a caravan, is the word that's used here. This is a large number of people that's traveling down the hillside out of Jerusalem, but traveling north to the Galilean region, to Nazareth, uh, maybe not all of them going to Nazareth, but a lot of them traveling the same way. This is something that they do every year. And so you can imagine the way this, this crowd was made up. This is family, extended family, neighbors and friends. There was a particular amount of safety and, and enjoyability about this whole sort of a thing. Jesus was probably presumed to be with his cousins and his friends. They knew he was there somewhere until he wasn't, and there's the surprise. Um, again, they felt very, very safe and naturally so, and they made an assumption that Jesus was there with their extended party, and a day into the trip, they looked and couldn't find him. Uh, so this is where they shout Kevin, and uh, the story goes on. I'm sorry for the random Home Alone reference, but it comes to mind. Uh, so they finally realize it, and they go through the whole crowd they can't find, so they go all the way back to Jerusalem. So they're a day's journey, a day's walk away from Jerusalem when they realize it. I thought you had him, right? So they go through everybody. They make a day's trip all the way back, and finally on the third day, they come to find Jesus in the temple, listening to the rabbis and asking questions. And so they finally make their way back to Jerusalem, uh, verse 44, they supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey. They began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Alfred Edersheim. I'll suggest him to you in his work, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, uh, but Alfred Edersheim does a very, very good job of getting into the culture of the day, the day in which Jesus lived, getting into the Jewish culture and explaining that to us. Uh, but Edersheim explains that the rabbis would circle up with people who wanted to learn, and they would have a question and answer time with them in these later days of the Passover week. So Mary and Joseph have left thinking Jesus was with them, probably after the first two days. The Passover is still going on. The Passover week and its festivities is still going on. Uh, the, in Herod's temple, if you will, uh, we're not talking Solomon's temple that we looked at Sunday evenings a couple months back, but it still has a lot of outdoor space, of portico space. And it was understood, according to Edersheim, that the rabbis would have a circle there during Passover week and people that wanted to study, that wanted to have their questions answered, would come and spend time with the rabbis. Um, their educational system of the day 
centered upon a discussion format. A discussion format. With a discussion format, uh, a circle really lends itself to that. Uh, we, we've been doing evening services and uh, prayer meetings downstairs around the tables. We put the tables in a big rectangle and we only sit on the outside of them. More or less, we're circled up. We can see each other. We can hear each other. We have space to write on tables in front of us. It's conducive to maybe a little bit more depth of Bible study, uh, and it's comfortable to us. Um, <coughs> my legs are jelly, and I'm looking forward to sitting down tonight. Uh, but um, they would circle up. I remember when I was teaching in Christian school in Virginia, uh, the pastor was very concerned because another teacher had said that the students were coming into his class or her classroom talking about me and my class, and that my class appeared to be a discussion class, and that everybody got to share what they thought truth was, and that my tests were all multiple guess and true and false, and that you didn't really have to know anything to pass my class. And I says, oh, well, I wish my tests were all true and false and multiple choice. I wouldn't be sitting up all night grading the things. And so I gave him, I said, I just gave a test yesterday. Can I put a copy in your mailbox? He said, sure, Nate, thanks. And so I did, and I put it there. And, um, he was the kind of man I, I wanted to please. He was the kind of man that was kind of hard to please and uh, had a little austerity to him. And so I sweated it. And for better than a week, I was worried because he didn't sound very pleased. And really, it was with how I taught my class and, and how I tested my students. And so I gave him that test, which was a short answer test. And um, a week later, he was heading into a prayer meeting ahead of me. I held the door for him. I says, hey, boss, did you get a chance to look at that test? And uh, he says, what? I says, well, you were worried about how I taught and about the nature of my test. Oh, he says, I'm not worried anymore. Carry on, he says, carry on. That was all there was to it. Well, I'll say this about discussion classes, and this has to do with any of our formats. Uh, Jason and I have had this conversation about men's breakfast. Men's breakfast, we, we go th typically go through a booklet, challenges us to get into the Bible a little bit, and it asks questions of us. There are study questions that bring out a conversation. And it's great, and we've had some wonderful conversations. I've learned things around that table, and, and, and hopefully, you know, the more involvement, the better. Discussion works, but may I suggest that there always needs to be at least one person in the room who has studied the thing out to thir thoroughly and knows the answer from Scripture. And so in that men's meeting, when Jason comes into that, he's got his homework done. And so if people go down a rabbit trail, he's gotten really good at bringing them back from those rabbit trails. It's a challenge sometimes on a Saturday morning. Uh, but um, somebody needs to know the answer. If a discussion class is, well, this might be true, but this might be true too, you're in big trouble because opinions, well, let me quote a famous baseball coach, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one and no two are the same. Uh, opinions are just that. They're opinions. They're worth what they're worth. There is truth in the Word of God. There is absolute truth in the Word of God, and we need to study to show ourselves approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Uh, that's what we need to do. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me, here, this was a discussion format. They were circled up. And I'll say this too. You learn a thing about a person by the questions they ask. There have been some membership classes with some young people, and I have gone home beaming because I was so excited by the questions kids were asking because it was showing that they were with me. It was showing that they cared what God thought. They cared what God wanted, and they wanted to know what God wanted them to know. That's exciting to me. And then, too, when somebody asks the right question, you know they get it, right? And so here's Jesus, and he's 12. And he's with the rabbis, and there's not one of them less than 30 years old. Most of them have long gray beards by now. Gamaliel was probably in their number, the foremost teacher of the law. And they were awestruck at Jesus' questions and his answers. Um, in your uh, notes here, I give amazement and astonishment as my uh, point headings here. Uh, Existanto, it's, they were beside themselves in amazement. I never realized until digging at this a little bit, the word amazement has the word maze in it. 
uh, a maze as in a tangled maze. Find your way through the maze. They're related words. Uh, they were beside themselves, literally beside themselves in amazement. Uh, they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Uh, this is not an ordinary 12-year-old boy, and this was very, very clear to them. And so here's Jesus. They're, they find him there. The rabbis are amazed at his questions and his answers. His understanding is really quite something. Our next point is astonishment. Um, verse 48, when they, that's Mary and Joseph, when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. Um, the word here means they were struck out of their senses. They were dumbstruck to find Jesus in the temple. They were amazed he wasn't with them. By the way, ponder this one a little bit. How much trouble had Jesus ever gotten in? When had he, had he been naughty or mis, mischievous? Uh, when had he backtalked mom and dad? When had he pushed the, 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 the lines, right? Kids, isn't it natural? You draw a line in the sand and where do their toes go? Just a wee bit over, certainly solidly on it, right? That's our human nature. Right to that line we go. Jesus didn't play those games with his mother. He was without sin from the very first day. His poor siblings, you know, I heard a Christian comedian not long ago. Think about growing up behind that. Why can't you be more like your brother? Whew, the pressure. Uh, but Mary and Joseph, this was astounding to them because they just assumed. They assumed Jesus was with the, the entourage making its way north. They, they knew he was a good kid, and they didn't worry about him. Uh, that's the nature of it. You worry about them less when they consistently make wise choices. And uh, so they just didn't know what to think of it. And then to find him virtually holding court, if you will, with the rabbis outside the temple, there at the temple grounds, this was astounding. Uh, they were literally beside themselves, struck out of their senses. They were in astonishment. And Mary's question was really focused on herself. Mary questioned why he would do this to them. I can identify with that, can't you? This was a natural way for her to think. Uh, why have you treated us this way? Or if I can very, very, very loosely paraphrase the original, which I'm not doing at all, don't misunderstand this, your father and I were worried sick. Can't you just hear the words? Can't you hear yourself saying those words? Your father and I were worried sick. Uh, why have you done this to us? And notice the Savior's response. He gives a radically different perspective. Verse 49, and he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, this is not, why do you care? What are you looking for me for? This is not snarky disrespect at all. This is Jesus, sinless Jesus. He's saying to them simply and innocently, I think, certainly here, um, why were you looking for me? And I think really it was, didn't you know, wouldn't it make sense where I'd be? Um, <coughs> excuse me, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, there, uh, King James says about my father's business. The phrasing there, it's, it's, it's of my father's, and it's a little vague about what of my father's. In context, we're talking about location. We're talking about geography, if you will. It's, uh, I think it really had to do with his, the problem wasn't who he was thinking about. It was where he was. They couldn't find him because he wasn't where they assumed him to be. They were struck you know, out of their minds because they found him where they never assumed he would be. And uh, to him, it made all the sense in the world because he knew who his father really was. That's a huge part of the whole passage. Uh, is it a surprise that I'm in my father's house? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? By the way, very unique for him to say my father. 
the Jews referred to God as the Father often, very often. But they always said Heavenly Father or Our Father, and it wasn't normal for them to say My Father. Jesus' relationship was obviously that direct. Uh, he truly was the Son of God, and so it is unique that He would say My Father. And here in Jesus' first recorded words in Scripture, He speaks of His true parentage. God Most High is His Father. And he comes to realize that. And since God was His Father, His Father's house was the natural place for Him to be. Uh, it was natural for Him to get there. Um, I love, F.F. <coughs> F. Bruce calls it involuntary preoccupation on Jesus' part. I thought that was an interesting way to put that. He didn't mean any disrespect he didn't have any sinful intention whatsoever in it. He was just excited about it and did what seemed right. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing to be excited about. And he, I don't think, had really a concept of what he was doing to his mom and to his dad. Um, Jesus continued, it says here, but they did, let's see, I'm sorry. Um, Verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Again, you know, we, we get kids typically when they're little, right? So that we can grow with them because there's a lot to learn with parenting. That's kind of the nature of it. And Mary and Joseph, they knew academically he will be called the son of the most high. That's what the angel told Mary. The baby in you, God's going to overshadow you so that that baby will be called the son of the most high. So she knows it's God's son, but she doesn't understand it to be God's son in the way that you and I, with all these years and all this scripture at our fingertips, understand him to be God's son. This is being revealed to her a little bit at a time. It's being revealed to Joseph a little bit at a time. This is the last mention of Joseph in Luke. Joseph isn't mentioned in the story of Jesus' ministry. Joseph isn't mentioned in the story of the cross. Matter of fact, we kind of know Joseph isn't around because the Lord looks down from the cross and puts the, puts the disciple, John, the beloved disciple, in charge of taking care of his mother. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And from that day, she went into his house. So Joseph is, is out of the equation by now. And um, <coughs> there's a whole study to be made there. Jesus had half-brothers that could have taken Mary in, but uh, he wanted his brother John to do it. And... Um, this is the last we hear of Joseph in any of this. Uh, but here, Jesus makes this statement. But notice, he co as it continues, verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. He continued in subjection. In other words, he had not disrespected, he had not disobeyed. He was still the sonless son of God. And he voluntarily obeyed his earthly father, Joseph, his earthly mother, Mary. Uh, he was in subjection to them as well as should be. Um, Mary treasured these things in her heart. We have this after the shepherds come. Uh, Mary kept all these things and treasured them in her heart, pondering over and over what's going on here, thinking this through. Here she's described very much the same way she keeps all these things and treasures them in her heart. And then verse 52, Jesus matured naturally in wisdom, size, and favor with God and man. Um, close your eyes. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. I didn't get that tacked into my second uh, rendition of my text here this morning. Uh, but Jesus grew. Uh, I find that amazing. To think of him growing physically, well, we know that he came as an embryo and he was born as an infant and he, and he grew and so forth. And we, we get all these pictures and, you know, here we have the idea of a 12-year-old boy on the cusp of adulthood, but not quite there. And then we have the summary statement that covers the entire rest of Jesus' growing up. He grows in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, in favor with man. Four areas of growth. The one that makes the most sense is the stature, the physical part. Okay, came as a baby, grew to a man. We get that. Growing in wisdom. What seems plain here is this. When he humbled himself, 
when he humbled himself to the womb, when he humbled himself to the manger, and so forth, he humbled himself to learn and to have a developing brain. We think about the growing on the outside, right? And, and we know how that looks and so forth. And we see young men and they get to a certain age and they all get taller than the preacher before you know it. And it's just how things happen around here. Uh, but we, we can watch that on the outside. But on the inside, the brain is developing. I'll remind you again, parents, that part of the brain that determines right and wrong and makes moral judgments, they've come to realize it's not fully developed until age 25. A lot of our mistakes in our youth make more sense when we put that in perspective, don't they? Maybe that helps you forgive yourself for something, I don't know. But may it help us as we lead young people, we need to be there for them. I've said often, I need to be that stick in the mud that, that straight stake that's pounded down next to the seedling sapling tree that helps that tree grow strong and straight. And it's going to so far exceed me. That's my goal. But my job is to be that stick in the mud, if you will, that helps that tree get a straight start and do what it needs to do. And parents, that's so much of our job. And that job, I've had people say to me, well, you know, the child can make their own spiritual decisions. They're 12 now. Huh. You need to think that one through. Scripture says train them up. That doesn't say let them make their own decisions. It's, your household is not about a democracy. It's about a teaching opportunity. And that's a fleeting teaching opportunity. And you're going to come to a day where your ability to teach is going to be very, very, very diminished. And you can just kind of be there for them on the outside. Take those opportunities while you have them. Teach them while you can. But the inside, the, the, the spiritual self, the emotional self, the mental self, still grows too. And for Jesus, it grew same as for us. He also grew in favor with God and with man. It's pointed out that Luke, in most of Luke's discussions about Jesus, especially before the cross, people's interactions with him are positive. I'll tell you my experience. I've seen some Christians get tremendously picked on in a secular world. I've seen some Christians who really lived for the Lord who didn't get picked on all that much. I think the very biggest of the things that are in our ability to change or to do anything about, one of them that matters the most is consistency. Consistency. If I'm the guy that wants to do the right thing and please God and I say no to all of these things consistently, people are going to take note of that. If I'm not consistent or I have hidden sins that people see that, they don't, that I think they don't see, people aren't going to have respect for that at all. They, they eat up in consistency. Be as consistent as you can be in the Lord. Take a stand for him. Teach your kids to take a stand. Give them a regular dose to Daniel. My goodness, did Daniel make a stand in the beginning of that book, and he kept making a stand the rest of his life. You know, when it became illegal to pray, Daniel just went and did what he'd always been doing. Some folks, you know, if it had became illegal to pray, they'd have to start praying to get in trouble. Daniel just went back to what he'd always been doing. That was consistent with him. I think it's possible, Jesus did it, to grow in favor with God and with men. Uh, the other thing is, what, which men do you want their favor? Uh, forgive me, my brain's having a hard time putting things together this morning. Uh, it's uh, not very eloquent up there. Uh, but who are we trying to please? Who are we trying to please? You know, good people know good people. People that are living according to the Word of God recognize it in other people. People that are students of the Word of God recognize it in other people. People that want to consistently be prudent and do the right thing recognize that in other people. Are we trying to please the right people? Uh, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, God's grace was upon him in verse 40 where we started, and uh, he showed it. And in this passage, as we looked at it, uh, Jesus stood up and, and said, I need to be in my Father's house. That's the natural place for me to be. And uh, I have to think that was a lot for, for Mom and Joseph to have to sort their way through. Uh, I feel for them, uh, but the Lord put it right there. But even saying that, from that day forward, he continued to be in subjection to them. And it's a wonderful picture for us. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for our Savior. And uh, thank you, Lord, for this little glimpse uh, into his childhood, Lord, this one glimpse that we do get, and uh, we're grateful for it. 
We thank you, Lord, that he truly was the Son of Man, human enough to die for us, uh, to truly die, but that, Lord, he was also the Son of God, and as such, the only spotless lamb who could permanently pay the price uh, for the forgiveness of our sin. We thank you for our Savior, and we pray it in his name. Amen. In closing, number 549. Let's stand together. 549 in your book. Like a river glorious.